Welcome to the Membership Guys podcast. Kick-ass advice and tips for membership site owners. Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in for another episode of the Membership Guys podcast. I'm your host Mike Morrison, one half of the Membership Guys and we are membership site experts. And this is the show in which we talk all things membership, just in case the uh, dozen or so mentions of the word membership and membership website didn't quite get that message across. We're joined on today's episode by Pat Flynn, who a lot of you will know from smartpassiveincome.com, an insanely popular blog and podcast centered around the world of online business. Now, Pat has just written and released his second book, Will It Fly?, which is about one of my favorite subjects, and that is idea validation. Now, if you've listened to this podcast for a while, if you've been reading the blog, you'll know that I bang the drum over and over about the importance of actually validating your idea for your membership site. Well, Pat has written what is a fantastic book. I received it the day of launch, read it cover to cover. It's got some great exercises and a great process that you can go through in order to actually evaluate, research and prove your ideas before you actually roll out. And that's so, so important for membership site owners to do, particularly given just how much of a time sink doing the actual creation and building side of a membership site is. And the absolute worst thing that can happen is you launch your membership site and nobody turns up because it was never a good idea in the first place. So I talked to Pat a little bit about his background, a little bit about how the book came to be, and we discussed various aspects of idea validation, of researching and evaluating your potential business idea for your online business or your membership site. So we're going to jump right now into my conversation with Pat Flynn. Okay, so I'm joined today by Pat Flynn, the founder of Smart Passive Income, which is a hugely successful blog and podcast on the subject of online business. And he is the author of a brand new book, Will It Fly? Pat, thanks so much for taking time out in the middle of all the launch <laughs> craziness to uh, join me today for the podcast. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me. It's it's interesting because this is the first interview I've done after the launch. And to hear you say author of Will It Fly after it's out, it's like, it's really cool. It's like actually real. <laughs> now so thank you are you going to tag that on your business cards now you can wear a nice little badge it's It's not just an ebook too it's like physical it's like yeah it's a real (laughs) i've got it here it's i'm touching it over here in the uk i have a copy of the book that's so cool it's awesome um so obviously you know a lot of people will know you for smallpassiveincome.com but for anyone who has been living under a rock uh, could you give a, a little bit of a bio, a little bit of info about you, your background, and uh, how all of this came to be? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it's inter- it's an interesting story. It kind of, I guess, starts after college when I went to school for architecture. I got a great job of, uh, in, an, in the architecture world, uh, and that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I was planning on it until 2008 when I got laid off and I got let go, which was unfortunate, and I didn't really know what I was going to do at the time. And, you know, I'm trying to make this story kind of uh, shorter than than usual. I mean, what happened was I discovered this world of online business and I took some knowledge I had about this exam that I took while I was an architect and I packaged it into a website and I packaged it into products and practice exams and stuff that people could buy to help them pass the exam. And, you know, my very first product launched in October of 2008 after I was let go and uh, it it did really well. I sold it for $19.99. It was just an ebook and it had Mm. generated $7,908.55 uh, that that month of October 2008. And that was completely life-changing. I mean, it changed everything. It changed what I believed I could do myself. It, be- it changed my belief in online business and internet business because a lot of the people I researched at the time were very sort of not the kind of people I'd want to really hang around with. You know, they were yeah. just scammers yeah. and oil, snake oil salesmen, that sort of thing. And, you know, here I was doing online business, but doing it in a way that I felt was very honest and I was helping people out. And not only that, I was getting these incredible notes uh, of thank yous from people who I had helped pass past that exam who had gotten then promoted or who was, you know, gotten raises and things like that as a result. And, you know, it was, it was just such a cool feeling. And I wanted to share all of this, everything that happened, how I built the whole thing, how I, uh, what I did wrong and everything. I, I, I turned that into a packaged website, smartpassiveincome.com, where I just blogged. I've been blogging there since October 2008. 
and uh, just revealing as much information as I can about everything that I've done, everything that I am doing. And now I sort of call myself the crash test dummy of online business where <laughs> I put myself on the front line and I just smash into that brick wall to see if that thing that everybody talks about is working or not. And I just report back to everybody to share like what I did right, what I did wrong, things that I would do differently, all that sort of stuff. And along the way, I'm just helping as many people as I can uh, with their own online businesses. So, so they don't have to go through, you know, a major layoff or life changing moment to discover all these things that are possible out there. And, yeah. you know, now I'm speaking, I'm an author now, I'm, I'm people are, you know, I, I'm in this really cool leadership role in this space that I've never dreamt I would be in, but I'm but I'm definitely owning it. And I'm trying to, to make the best of it to help as many people as I can. And it's such an awesome story. And obviously, from that position of being laid off, which for that that period of time, I'm sure plenty of our listeners will have either gone through that themselves or know somebody who has been put in that situation where all of a sudden, your big life plan, the career for life is, is sort of pulled away from you. Mm -hmm. So you obviously would kind of had to hustle quite quickly, I'd imagine, to to get that first product out. Over the years through being this crash test dummy of online business, how has your approach to testing and trialing new ideas evolved from that, presumably what was, was it a rushed process initially? Was it a, a kind of, we need to get something making money quickly for your first product? Yeah, I mean, um, it, it kind of was. I didn't really have anything else, but I mean, I, I was, I my wife back then, fiance, it was like the timing of the layoff was per, per, quote perfect. I'm doing air quotes <laughs> while I say that because I had just proposed <laughs> to my girlfriend. She said yes, and then I get let go. So that, wow. you know, I was like, wow, this is crazy. But she was beautifully supportive at the time uh, and has continued to be supportive ever since. And back then we both decided to move back in with our parents to save some money while I was doing this thing and, and trying to make it work. And, you know, because there was no other option, I mean, I actually tried to get back into architecture. I felt like I did things that I wouldn't normally do. I took risks that I wouldn't normally take. And I took bold actions that were required for me to, to, to make it work. And, you know, was it rushed? It, it wasn't necessarily rushed, but I, I definitely wanted to do it right. Um, but my, my approach has changed over time because now that I have uh, a lot more, uh, you know, leeway and I have, uh, you know, uh, a lot more opportunities to try new things. And of course, since then, a lot of new opportunities have come about for everybody. Um, I, I've been I've been trying to take it in a very smart way and trying to make sure that I package it in a way that uh, I can share that so others can benefit from that. And that's really what Will It Fly has become. It's, it's through, through my own experience and a lot of other people's experiences because they're featured in the book too who have validated their products before selling it. You know, I've been able to, to see and put it all into something that would help people the most, I feel. Because, you know, I found over time by helping a lot of entrepreneurs and getting to know a lot of people who are just starting out that one of the biggest fears that people have is just, you know, working on something that, that, that fails uh, yeah. because it's, it's that time you put into it. It's, it's your pride also. Um, and, you know, I know as, as somebody who has worked on stuff a lot, it doesn't, it doesn't feel good to, to fail. Um, and so having that confidence to know that that thing you're working on up front is, is key. And uh, so that, that's what I'm trying to do with, uh, with Will It Fly here. And, um, you know, hopefully people like it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I got my copy through this morning, read it cover to cover, really enjoyed it, awesome. um, which is good because had I not, this this might have been a very different conversation. <laughs> but it is, it's a great, great book. And it's a topic that we're constantly banging the drum about to our own audience too, idea validation, and actually, you know, evaluating that you have a good business idea, you have a workable business idea that's right for you and that you're right for. Mm -hmm. And we see so many membership sites fail, whether it's you know people coming to us in a situation where they've invested so much time and so much money into their membership site, and it's because they've ended up getting so occupied straight away with figuring out which WordPress plugin to use, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, whether to use lead pages or click funnels, and they've just skipped right past that point of actually researching their idea. Do you think that's more kind of symptomatic of um, entrepreneurs in in this day and age with the whole move towards a just ship it kind of mentality, mm -hmm. or 
Or do you think that's kind of something that has always been there? It's just more prevalent now because we hear more about it through social media and so on. Right. Well, I think it's a number of different things. For one, it is kind of, the, you know, Seth Godin made the, the phrase just ship very famous. Mm-hmm. And that's where you kind of, you just, just go. And, you know, I believe that in a sense where you, you have to take action because if you don't take any action, nothing's going to happen. So a yeah. lot of times we have this perfectionist mentality and no, you, you just have to ship, right? You can't, you can't be perfect. It's just kind of an excuse. But on the other hand, if you just ship, without doing any research behind it, then then you're going into grounds where you, you have no idea what, what might happen. And it's nice to know up front what's, what, what is going to happen. Um, I, also, I also think a part of it is, you know, a lot of us are afraid to do this research up front because we don't want, I mean, the purpose of the book and, and any validation is to know if it's going to work or not yeah. up front. Yeah. But I think a lot of us fear that answer that it's not going to work. We'd much, we, you know, we feel better about working on something when there's still a chance than knowing something is going to fail up front. Even though that, that it's obvious when you think about it, you, you'd want to know that it would fail up front. Mm-hmm. So you could move on to something that, that would. But I think it's human nature to just, you know, take action on that hope. And that's good. But when you just rely on hope and just rely on passion, it can, it can bite you in the butt later on. So you kind of have to have a nice blend of the two in terms of research and data and knowing and and also that hope and passion because obviously if you build businesses just to build businesses and you don't have any passion for it and there's there's you know there's no energy then it's going to also fail definitely and i think you also see i think people who uh, they'll maybe have their idea they'll ask their fiance they'll ask <laughs> their brother they'll ask their parents they'll all say yes this is a great idea and then they just run with it mm. yeah so um yes yeah, uh, the the process and everything obviously laid out within within will it fly obviously that's been shaped from your own experiences from people you've seen in the world of online business from connections and so on and you share a lot of great examples within the book too so for someone who is at square one Maybe they've just got that little acorn of an idea in their mind. They haven't done anything with it yet. Where do they start? What sort of process should they be taking generally to see whether that is an idea that could work for them? Yeah, so we're, we're talking specifically to people who are building membership sites, right? Or want to do that eventually, right? That's that's Yeah, your sure. Audience. Membership site or, or I suppose any kind of online business, maybe that's one of several potential ideas they've had. You know, yeah. oh, I could do a membership site. I could do coaching. I could do an online course. Right. Well, really what it comes down to is you want to get people to pay you for something up front. Um, that's the only way you would know if people will pay for it later. I mean, that's that's what Tim Ferriss said in the 4-Hour Workweek. The only way to truly validate, to t- truly know if somebody's going to pay you for something is to ask them to pay you for something. And yeah. it's kind of weird because initially you're like, what? You want people to pay for something that I haven't built yet? Um, but that happens all the time now. I mean, obviously events, you pay for an event before you go to it. But even beyond that, products from physical to digital, we're paying for a lot of these things up front now. For example, everything we purchase on Kickstarter, they're for ideas. They're for pe- people who are building stuff who haven't yet built that thing. But it's just, you know, the pledge that you that this thing's going to come out, you you pay for the idea, and then you're going to eventually get it later if they reach that pledge amount. And it's kind of the same thing what you're doing here. So, for example, if you are doing a coaching thing, you know, the biggest way to, to validate that is just to go out there and see if you can get one customer, right? Yeah. Because then you know, besides what some people, other people do is, is they, uh, you know, they'll, they'll build out their whole platform, you know, they'll work on, and I talk about this in the book, they'll work on their business cards and the website and the logo and like everything else first. And then they get it, they try to ask to get a customer and, yeah. then, and then they can't. And then, you know, you've wasted all that time doing all that fun stuff. And it is fun stuff to create your logo and build your brand, but you, you have no right, I mean, I guess you do, but you're doing it in the wrong order. You want to get the yeah. business first before you have all that other stuff coming in. If you're doing a membership site, I mean, I'm just thinking off the top of my head here, you would want to validate if you can get, for example, five paying customers to pay you up front, and then you would put them into, for example, a Facebook group from yeah. there. And then you work with them just in there, uh, and, and that's what they would get access to just to give them something up front. But then you can work with them to build out your membership site from there. And that's cool because they get a say and you get to build it in a way that you don't have to guess works, but you get to hear directly from your customer that it is going to work. And um, so, uh, you know, you'd be able to provide them content, show them pieces and bits and pieces of the membership site while they're in there. Uh, and again, they've paid up front, so they get probably a discount. But more than that, they get to help shape what the course becomes. And if you can't get people to do that, then what's going to make you think that after you build the whole thing out, 
that you're going to get people to come in. So that that's kind of what the, what the idea here is for that. Absolutely. And I think where perhaps some people may go wrong, I think, with idea validation when they're researching their, their idea is they're just trying to find out, is this idea good? Is there a market for it? Will people pay for it? But a lot of it does come down to, I think, as you said, there, can you actually get people to pay you? Mm-hmm. Because if, if you can't communicate your idea, if you can't actually get somebody to put their hands in the pockets, even if the idea itself is is good, or if your heart's not in it, I think probably one of the, the main things that stuck uh, with me from the book is actually starting with you. Mm-hmm. Not going into the idea, but starting with looking at yourself and what you want to achieve and what your vision is, which, again, I think a lot of people don't even think that. They'll, they'll look at something like a membership site, which is kind of the holy grail for a lot of people when it comes to online business. Totally. And they get attracted to that and they, you know, you'll see all the seven figure launch, eight figure launch, (laughs) set up your membership site in two hours kind of stuff. And they just get drawn to that when actually fundamentally it's kind of a non-starter for them as a person as well. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's so true. You have to see if you could do it first, but what's cool about, you know, the way I teach validation in the book um, is, is it's unlike what Tim Ferriss did where he, in 2007, he kind of put validation on the map, right? But he did it in a, in a different way. He did it where you'd set up a landing page, for example. You don't build the whole business out. You just set up the landing page and then you drive cold traffic to it. Or if you have an audience already, you, you, you drive traffic to that page of that thing you're going to sell and you keep track of how many people click on that buy now button. And that's how you would know and gauge whether or not this is something people are interested in. Now, there's some problems with that, right? Like maybe the sales page doesn't do a good job. Even though that thing that w- they would want, maybe the sales page, you know, there's a lot of variables that could go wrong, a lot of parts yeah, that yeah. could fail. Um, the, you know, the nice thing about the way you're supposed to do validation now is you actually talk to people, like have interactions with them. And even if that ad- idea doesn't work or even if they say it's good and they don't purchase, the best part about doing it this way is you can ask why and you could figure out what's wrong. So if for whatever reason, you go through this process and you find out that it doesn't work, you're at least going to have people that you can find out why. So you can make the necessary changes and just instead of just being kind of blind to, to the results. You know, that's really what this is all about is the interaction with your target customers. You're taking, you know, you have your whole target market, right? You're taking a small sample of them and you're running your idea with them through a, te- through a small little evaluation, a small test, if you will, kind of a small experiment. And then once you get it fine-tuned and figured out, then you go big scale with it and, you, and full scale knowing that it's already working. You have paying customers already. You're working with them to create it in a way that, that's, that, that needs to be done. You're putting all the modules in your membership site that's supposed, that are supposed to be there. You're not doing what a lot of people do in software and in membership sites, which is, you know, you build it first and you know, you think you know what modules you want in there. Yeah. Um, and, and you're potentially just wasting time or wasting everybody else's time. If you could get customers in first and work with them to create whatever it is that they need, not what you think they need, it's going to be every, everybody else's. Everybody's going to be happy. You're going to be happy. They're going to be happy. Everybody wins. Definitely. Because I suppose the worst time to ask someone what they actually want is after you've created it <laughs> or after you've created what you think that they want. So for somebody who who maybe has kind of skipped past this process, because like you say, design the logo is fun, design your website's fun. And even for someone non-techie, setting up your WordPress plugins for your membership and doing all that sort of stuff, that's kind of the, the almost sexy side of, of making your totally. idea, mm-hmm. uh, you know, rolling it out. So for someone who's skipped past the, the that initial stage, they've spent months, they've invested money into a membership site, they put all the modules into their courses, and then they've opened the doors and nobody comes. Can that be salvaged? Is there a way of kind of retroactively doing a bit of validation and then pivoting from there? Or is it the sort of thing where you, you may just write it off and then start fresh? No, I mean, there's always a way to go back and make, and fix things. That, that's what I feel. And I think if you're honest with everybody, uh, it's going to be even better because they're going to know that you are focused on providing them the best, the best value. Um, and when you can take them or maybe just a small sample of your existing audience through that process, it's going to be huge for everybody. And that, that's what I would do. I wouldn't necessarily send an email blast to everybody saying, hey, guys, I screwed up. Uh, we're, yeah. we're going to start over, but don't worry, you're going to stick around. It'll, it'll be great eventually. You don't want to do that. Take a small sample. Maybe it's just five, ten of your power users, you know, you, your most trusted people and, you know, the people who are most active in your community, for example, or people who you know have gotten results from what you've taught them, you know, and, and have an honest conversation with them and, and just talk about, you know, I feel like 
that we could go this way. What do you think about that? And just those interactions, those real life conversations are going to tell you so much from the mouths of your existing customers and, and user base. Uh, no matter how many you have, there's there's always people you could tap into. Um, and I think that's that's really where you would start if you have a business already. You could also run surveys. I've run surveys. Actually, I ran a survey last year that provided a lot of information about what I was doing wrong based on the data. And so I've actually made a lot of changes. That's what, actually where Will It Fly has come from. Uh, and uh, um, you know, it's it's definitely going to be better for everybody, but it wasn't in a direct way where I was saying, "Oh, I'm, I'm I need to pivot because this isn't working." No, it was more, yeah. "Hey guys, what's working for you? What's not?" And then I, I'm making changes for, based on those results from there. For sure, and and probably one of the biggest things about a membership site is that once your members have joined, they're there, they're in your community, so you've kind of got that that built in study group. Totally that, you utilize that. You that. It's so great. Yeah. Something that we we hear a lot from our own audience, and I'm sure is something you encounter, is where they have so many ideas. They just don't know which one they should go with. They don't know where to start. And it's not just a case of, you know, having that one idea that they can't pull the trigger on. They can't even narrow down an idea to start with because there's just so much rattling around their head. Right. What sort of advice would you give to people in that kind of situation where, you know, every other day there's a new shiny object or there's <laughs> new uh, there's a new Facebook for, um, you know, for Pilates instructors or something like that that right. pops into their head? I mean, there's so many ideas out there, right? That, that That's why I didn't write a book about finding ideas. I wrote a book mm. about, you know, how to test those ideas. Um, and really where it starts, if you have a ton of them, is to write them all down. Because sometimes when you see them on, pa- on paper, immediately a few will just either stand out to you or just be obvious that they should even be there. Because you know, our brains, they do a really great job of thinking of stuff, but they don't really do a good job of real time as you're thinking of stuff, putting them in order and creating hierarchies and all that sort of stuff. That's why I talk about mind mapping quite a bit. And that's, you know, I, that's where I would start. I was actually, you would write down all, all these ideas that you have, you know, and then start to prune that tree, if you will. And then one by one, start with the one that's most exciting to you and mind map it out. See if you can actually turn it into something that makes sense. You know, my, by mind mapping, I mean, writing down all the ideas you have related to that one thing and just starting to organize it into this thing that will eventually become your product or your membership site. And then do it again for another one and just see, and you know, eventually you're going to find that one or two stand out to you more than any of the others. And then that's where you start to connect the dots between your ideas and what the market actually needs. Because our ideas, you know, we we don't know even if we flush them out and and you know figure out what this thing actually is. You won't know until you start talking about it with other people and then actually sh- sharing it with the world if it's actually something that they want. And actually, the uh, market research is going to be really important too. So you know, going through your market map, for example, to find out all the different p- people and the products and the places that those people already exist to see what's already being served because you might have come up with something that uh, already exists or something else somebody has already tried, and you could see what else you could do better than what's already out there. Um, so, so that that's where I would start. You know, it's just really about weeding it out, but also, uh, you know, talking to people. I think, you know, even if you haven't done your mind maps on those ideas yet, just talking about it with others, you're going to see really quickly whether or not they have legs or not, or wings, if you will. Um, and you know, that's something that a lot of people struggle with. They don't want to talk about their ideas with other people because they're afraid of what people might think, or you know, more importantly, some people might think that uh, you know other people might steal their ideas. Yeah. Um, and I actually talk about that in the book too how that, that there's so many more benefits of speaking about your idea to other people than keeping it secret because they're going to be able to poke holes in it. They're going to be able to turn it into something that could be even better or give you confirmation that you should move on to the next steps and then actually keep continuing to validate it. Absolutely. And I love uh, where you talk about that in the book and you talk about you know having a conversation with uh, someone in line at Starbucks and just picking their brains, getting their honest feedback and their honest input. Totally. Buy them a coffee, like buy the person behind you coffee and then say, hey, do you mind if I ask you a quick question about this business I'm trying to start? Um, and then more, more like more than likely they will say yes and give you some golden information. I've, I've done that before. It's a little scary, right? You're like yeah. the stranger and you're buying them coffee. It's a little <laughs> weird. But you know what? If, you, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to step out of your comfort zone. And, and it's good practice, actually. I, I don't know if you know who Noah Kagan is. But yeah, sure. He came on my podcast once and he challenged all my readers to go to Starbucks and ask for a discount. It's like, who, who does that? Well, he challenged everybody to do that because you have to do things that are kind of 
abnormal and make you uncomfortable a little bit in order to, to, to win as an entrepreneur. That's, that's really what it's about. It's about mm. fig- figuring out a way and it's not always going to be easy, but, uh, you know, so that was a cool exercise. I don't know if people in your audience want to do that, but, um, you know, the coffee challenge is what, what it calls it. <laughs> Although I've got to say, for some reason, when I was reading that, I was picturing, uh, the Starbucks in Times Square. Uh, we were just in New York over Christmas. And so I was picturing that and kind of imagining the reception there may be a little bit different, in yeah. New York get to out Starbucks. Here. What are you doing? You're lying so <laughs> yeah. long. Get out of here. <laughs> exactly. So um, I can imagine it probably goes down a little bit better in San Diego, which is... Hey, but uh, you know what? If you get rejected, that's a part of the process too, you know? Lost my train of thought now. My uh, so. my uh, impression threw you off because it was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> They're usually pretty bad, so... Yeah, I think one of the, one of the other stories in the book that uh, I really kind of resonated with me was uh, where you talk about your interview with Andrew Warner. Uh, oh, yeah. for Mixergy and that question of whether you're you're playing big enough whether you're aiming big enough mm-hmm. and the realization that you had in, in kind of asking yourself that question of of actually you're playing small enough and and focusing more on the niches and the idea from Kevin Kelly of having a thousand true fans is that something you see with your own audience when they talk about their business ideas perhaps they are seeing all this talk of as we said, the seven-figure launch, eight-figure launch, and they perhaps end up thinking a bit too big or they're trying to boil the ocean. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think there's kind of an aversion to to staying small? I think people worry about being too small, and I think that's why we try to get into spaces that we know are very successful, but oftentimes mm-hmm. because we go too general, uh, we have no chance. You know, the, the smaller you get in your niche, the more likely it is to uh, become that expert, the one that everybody talks about. And you can start small. It doesn't mean you can ha- you have to stay small. You just continue mm-hmm. to grow out, uh, you know, outward and from there. Um, but, you know, it's, it's about, you know, that, man, that interview with Andrew Warner, was was insane, you know. There was so much lead up to it, and then you know, knowing that he's this crazy interviewer, I knew I was going to be in for some uh, d- deep, uh, tough questions. And that, you know, he started out right away with that. And so, you know, the lead exam, like nobody knows what that is except people who are in the architecture space who are taking that exam. But to them, my website was like the website to be on every single day. Yeah, uh, you know, and and even though I, it's not the entire world, it was their world. And from there, I, I was able to, uh, you know, help out a lot of people, but also get them to spread my spread the word about me. Um, and then I could have, I didn't, but I could have at that point expanded into other exams in the architecture space. But it was at that point I got laid off and Smart Passive Income became my sort of next big project from there. Uh, but I did have those opportunities. And so if you stay within a market, you could just start in a smaller area of that market and then expand out uh, from there. That's what I, th- there's a woman in, in who I featured, I think uh, it was case study number three, Jennifer Barcelos, who created Namastream in Willowfly, mm. who validated the software product for yoga instructors to have their yoga uh, classes be streamed online and be uh, available online in, li- in a library to their members. Uh, and that did really well. And then I actually interviewed her yesterday again for a launch party for my book. And she just told me that she now has people that aren't yoga inst- instructors using her software. She has uh, gym coaches and other health related coaches coming in there and using her software. So even though she didn't have it for that specific purpose, she's been able yeah. to expand out of that because just people in the yoga industry, I mean, they seem to know everybody else in the health space. So they talk to each other and it becomes a solution that other people can use too. So, you know, thinking small isn't bad. And I think when you niche down, I mean, if you're going to target somebody to, to validate with, you want to target with the specific exact person who has that specific problem that you're building a solution for uh, and that's where that's where you should start yeah for sure and I, I suppose as well it kind of brings a full circle back around to starting with uh, you and what you want and what you want to achieve in your in your life and then looking at how how your business idea fits with that mm-hmm. so yeah the, the kind of too big or too small is all kind of relative to how big or how small you actually want to be right pat Thank you so much for spending the time, uh, especially in your launch week for the book. I'm glad it's going really well for you. Can you let our listeners know where they can obviously buy the book, find out more information, maybe a little bit about the um, the course that accompanies it as well, which I haven't yet had a chance to check out. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, so the book can be found at willitflybook.com. That's all, all you need to go is there. 
willitflybook.com. And then there's a, an accompanying course. It's a companion course that's sort of like a, a resource you can use while you read along that has some bonus videos, some worksheets that you could download that I reference in the book, and also all the links mentioned in the book. This was like created for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons was because one of my biggest pet peeves is when I read books that tell me to click on links. Yeah. You know, I have to keep track of them. I have to remember. I have to, you know, I have, it's hard for me to find them all in one place. Well, I created a chapter by chapter companion course that has all the links for that chapter that you're reading, like clickable already there for you. Um, and so it, it's really cool. There's there's a lot of people in it right now who are enjoying it. And again, it's not an, a standalone course, but it's one that goes along with the book. The book references it and it references the book. And so there's a lot of cool things that go along with that. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, yeah, for any of our listeners who are still kind of in that stage of rattling around their ideas or trying to kind of turn that nugget of an idea into something tangible or figure out whether it's something worth pursuing. Uh, or even if you have jumped into siphling through WordPress plugins, trying to pick themes and all that sort of stuff, get a copy of this book, give it a read, complete the exercises, check out the accompanying course. Your business will thank you for it in the end. Uh, Pat, thanks again so much for taking the time out for joining us on the podcast. I really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, where, other than obviously willaflybook.com, can people get a bit more info about you, connect with you on social media and so on. Yeah, absolutely. You can uh, check me out at Pat Flynn on most of the uh, major social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, Periscope. Uh, you can also find just everything located at smartpassiveincome.com. Awesome. Pat, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks again to Pat for taking the time out of his very busy schedule. And that's no joke. This is literally the day after the book has launched. So it's uh, undoubtedly a crazy, crazy time right now for Pat and the team. So thanks again for him taking the time to share a bit of insight, share some of his uh, expertise with us. I really hope you guys got a lot from that and particularly any of you who are sitting on an idea and you are thinking about setting up a membership site, you're not quite sure where to start. I definitely recommend you check out the book, willitflybook.com. Get yourself a copy, follow the process, complete the exercises and check out the companion course too because that whole process will help you to evaluate your idea to establish whether it's one that's worth pursuing. So be sure to check Check that out. That's it for this episode of the Membership Guys podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks again for taking the time out to download and listen to the show. And as always, if you enjoyed the show, be sure to head over to iTunes.com and leave us a glowing five-star review saying lots of nice things about the podcast. And I'll be back next week, same bat time, same bat channel, with another episode of the Membership Guys podcast. If you've enjoyed today's episode of the Membership Guys podcast, we invite you to check out the membersiteacademy.com. The Member Site Academy is the essential resource for anyone at any stage of starting, growing and running a membership website. So whether you're still figuring out what your idea is going to be or whether your website is already up and running and you're just looking for ways to grow it and attract new members, then the Member Site Academy can help you to get to the next level. With our extensive course library, monthly training, exclusive member-only discounts, perks and tools and a supportive community to help you along the way with feedback, encouragement and advice, the Member Site Academy is the perfect place to be for anyone looking to start, manage and grow a successful membership website. So check it out at membersiteacademy.com.